Hey everybody, welcome back to another video. Now, as you can probably see, I am back out in the bush, which means it is time to find some cool stuff again. Given the recent heavy rain we've been having, it should have stirred up the activity of the local wildlife a lot. So without further ado, let's get moving. It wouldn't be a foray without searching for some huntsmen. And while there weren't quite as many as last time, they still did not disappoint. This is an adult female Isopeda queenslandensis, a fairly large species that is quite common here in the southeast. And here is a mature male of the same species. As is typical of mature male spiders, he is noticeably more gangly than his female counterpart, with a smaller body and longer, thinner legs. On top of that, his palpal bulbs are clearly visible. These are the structures that he uses to hold and deliver sperm. And if you're interested in seeing how he uses them, I have recently uploaded a Huntsman pairing video where you can get pretty close and personal with him getting pretty close and personal. And now for a different species of Huntsman, this is Holconia immanis eating what could only be a rather uncomfortable mouthful. Holconia immanis is one of Australia's largest huntsmen, though for some reason I only ever seem to find juveniles. Moving on from the huntsman, we have this intriguing little spider. This is a member of the family Selenopidae, commonly known as the flatties or wall spiders. The species is probably Caraops raveni, which I've read is a rather common species here in southeastern Queensland, and the images certainly seem to match up as well. Selenopids are found not only in Australia, but in the Americas, Europe, Africa and Asia, so they're a very widespread family of spiders. They are also among the fastest moving spiders in the world. In particular, their turning speed is among the quickest of any animal. Selenopids, both behaviourally and visually, bear quite a strong resemblance to huntsmen. That being said, with a little bit of practice, it is quite easy to tell the two apart. In huntsmen, the eyes are arranged in two clearly defined rows, each with four eyes. In selenopids, it is markedly different, with six of their eyes appearing to form a single row. Now for a rather different type of spider, this is a Sandalodes species, a member of a spider family known as the Salticidae or jumping spiders. The jumping spiders are the most speciose of all the spider families, 
and comprise, if I recall correctly, about 13% of spider species overall. As is typical for jumping spiders, Sandalodes is an active daytime hunter, using its excellent eyesight to seek out its prey. And in contrast, here's a spider that's a bit more laid back. This is Thomisus spectabilis, the spectacular crab spider. And boy is she spectacular. The odd shape of these spiders makes them very cumbersome movers, so active hunting is not an option for these guys. Instead, they excel at ambush predation. So in essence, they're campers. The front four legs of a crab spider are large, powerful, and adorned with spines, making them excellent for seizing an unsuspecting prey item and holding it in place while the spider finishes it off with a bite. While white is the most common colour for this species, Formicus spectabilis can also come in yellow as well, and they seem to have some capability to change their colour depending on the background, albeit nowhere near to the same extent or rapidity as something like an octopus. So it's safe to say that my eight-legged friends didn't disappoint on this trip. And the same could definitely be said for the insects as well. Stick insects, like this male Didymuria, often dwell high up in the canopy and are hence infrequently encountered. However, heavy rains can force them from their lofty perches, bringing them closer to the ground where they're a lot more easily seen. Rainy weather is, however, a double-edged sword when it comes to finding stick insects. Sure, it means you're probably going to have an easier time locating them, However, many of the ones you do spot are likely to be a little bit battered to say the least. For example, this impressively sized insect, which I believe to be an Ancaiali ostrotessellata, is missing two of its legs, so essentially it's a tetrapod. And just for clarification's sake, that was a joke. That is not how taxonomy or anything works. Ancaiali ostrotessellata is quite a common species around Brisbane, and I have encountered a few of them. In most cases, because I encountered them in rainy weather like this one, they were injured to varying degrees, although they still seem to be able to walk alright. Stick insects as a whole are probably a lot more abundant than many people realise, but their habitats combined with their almost perfect camouflage mean encounters are quite sporadic.
After its quick time in the spotlight, I released the stick insect back into the tree. And my camera once again showed that it is about as good as the average student at focusing on the right bloody thing. The last of the stick insects was unfortunately deceased. This is another Didamuria, or the one like the first one, this is a female. Easily distinguishable from her male counterpart by her plump body and her comparatively very small wings. These wings cannot be used for flight, however they are not completely functionless. They are brightly coloured and can be exposed in a threat display to ward off a potential predator. So that's it with the stick insects. Now a very cool looking beetle. I have not been able to identify this beetle yet, which of course greatly limits what I'm able to say about it. But it basically looks like the insect version of Darth Maul, so there's no way I'm not including it in the video, it's just too bloody awesome. It was also pretty apparent that Mr. Darth Maul Beetle here was having a considerable amount of trouble climbing up this tree trunk, but still a better climber than funnel webs. Now for something I can actually give you a little bit of information on. Here we have a member of the family Gralacrididae, commonly known as the Raspy Crickets. However, in spite of what the common name implies, these insects, while closely related, are not actually crickets. And there's another reason why common names are useless. Here we have a rather interestingly patterned grasshopper. Like raspy crickets, true crickets and katydids, grasshoppers belong to the insect order Orthoptera. However, unlike those three groups that I mentioned, which all have long, flexible antennae, grasshoppers possess antennae that are short, thick, and stiff. So that is the spiders and the insects covered. Now let's take a look at some more miscellaneous stuff. Like this snail, for which I spent ages waiting for it to come out of its shell. And just as it seemed like it was about to get out and start moving around, a large crowd of annoyingly noisy tourists passed behind me and brought me all the way back to square one. Fungi, like this Boletellus, also put on quite the show in this rainy weather. These spectacular structures, the only parts of a fungus that most of us will notice, are their sporocarps, or fruiting bodies, a name that is pretty apt as their function is somewhat analogous to that of a fruit. Alike to the fruits of a plant, fungal sporocarps bear the next generation. Although unlike the majority of plants which reproduce via seeds, fungi reproduce with spores which are minute in size compared to most seeds. Their minuscule size means that spores can be very easily distributed by the wind. And the classic mushroom shape of many sporocarps is a very effective form for further aiding spore dispersal. The hymenium, which is the fertile surface bearing the fungus's spores, is situated on the underside of the cap. In many cases, the surface of the hymenium is fairly complex, 
often consisting of structures such as gills or pores. This increases the surface area of the hymenium, allowing more spores to be produced per fruiting body. A stem elevates the cap above the substrate, meaning that when the spores fall from the underside, they'll have a longer distance to travel and are therefore more likely to be picked up and transported by the wind. Wind is harnessed by many fungi for spore dispersal, but some achieve the same ends through more complex means. These are the fruiting bodies of Acero rubra, one of a group of fungi collectively known as the stinkhorns. Stinkhorns are immensely variable in their appearance, and each one seems to be more bizarre than the last, though there are a few commonalities between all species. The fruiting bodies of all stinkhorns initially take the form of egg-like structures, which when mature will rupture, releasing the rapidly expanding spore-bearing receptacle. The spores of these fungi are contained within a gelatinous mass known as the glebe, visible here as a brownish slime located on the basal portions of the tentacles. The glebe is often malodorous, and while it is rather repulsive to our noses, it is quite attractive to a variety of carrion feeding insects, notably flies. Flies will walk all over the glebe, and this activity of course leads to them becoming coated in the fungus's spores, meaning that when the flies move off, they will be carrying the next generation of stinkhorns with them. So that's the end of this video. I would be very interested to hear what your opinions are about the fungi because Truth be told, I am every bit as crazy about fungi as I am about arthropods, and I would love to start featuring them in more videos. I haven't because I felt like it's a bit out of the scope of this channel, so if you enjoy the fungi content, then let me know because I would be absolutely keen to keep posting it. If you enjoy my videos, then feel free to check out some of my other uploads. I've filmed quite a few more videos out in the field, and of course, don't forget to subscribe either. Thank you all very much for watching, that is it from me, and I shall see you again very soon.